Welcome, friends. James Corbett here, CorbettReport.com, with your edition of Propaganda Watch for this week. And this week, we are setting our sights on MotherJones.com, which recently published this article, Political Extremists Are Using YouTube to Monetize Their Toxic Ideas. A new report says the site has become a breeding ground for conspiracy theorists and white supremacy. So this article has been filed by Tony Riley on September 18th, 2018, and I think you know where this is going, but let's go there. If you search for Federal Reserve on YouTube, one of the first videos to surface is titled Century of Enslavement. Using archival footage and the kind of authoritative male voice, thank you very much, heard in countless historical documentaries, the 90-minute video espouses the idea that the Federal Reserve was formed in secret by powerful, often Jewish, banking families in the early 20th century, causing America to spiral into debt. With over 1.6 million views, the video is categorized as news and politics. It was created by a channel called The Corbett Report, which also boasts documentaries touting conspiracy theories, including that 9-11 was staged by the U.S. government and that global warming is a hoax. Watching the video quickly leads users down a rabbit hole of recommended videos that detail Illuminati conspiracy theories and blame Israel for 9-11. All right, so... This report goes on from there, and uh, we will go through some of it, but let's just turn our attention to a few, just a few of the obvious anomalies and inaccuracies that we have been presented with so far, not the least of which being that this report is all centering around these YouTubers monetizing their toxic ideas on YouTube, and uh, oh, look at how they're able to make money from YouTube by putting up these crazy conspiracy theories. I mean, first of all, you'll go to Century of Enslavement on YouTube, and you'll note that it isn't monetized because I don't monetize any of my videos on YouTube. I'm very explicit about that and adamant, and I have been four years. I've never taken a cent from YouTube and never would. Um, that's the whole point of the work that I do. So, in fact, that's glaringly inaccurate. And of course, again, they talk about, they, they characterize this work with their own words. It has nothing to do with what I've said. If you want to hear what I actually said, you can go to Century of Enslavement, preferably not on GooTube, although it is there. But if you go to CorbettReport.com slash Federal Reserve, you can find the MP3 audio and MP4 video versions of this documentary available for free download from directly from my servers, where it will not be censored quite as easily as on YouTube. Uh, as well as color information pamphlet and a black and white information pamphlet if you are so inclined to spread the word on this subject. And, of course, there's the hyperlinked transcript with every single word said in the documentary and the links right back to the source documents of all the different things that I talk about in the documentary, as I do with all my documentaries, so that you can go and check this information for yourself, including, of course, a direct link to the Saturday Evening Post uh, article where one of the co-conspirators admitted... Yes, we conspired in secret to form what became the Federal Reserve. And you can go and, again, you can go read it with your own eyes. Don't trust James Corbett or the Corbett Report, quacky conspiracy theorist. Go read it with for yourself, and here's the link. Which, oddly enough, Mother Jones won't provide you, right? Uh, interesting the way that this works, and the way that they try to smear people who don't tow the appropriate lines in the appropriate ways. And this Mother Jones article stems from... This series of tweets, uh, this tweet thread started by Chris Hayes of MSNBC, who wrote that my favorite example of how intentionally toxic YouTube's algorithm is, is this. Imagine you're, high school freshman, you're a high school freshman and got a school assignment about the Federal Reserve. You watch videos on YouTube all the time, so you go home and put Federal Reserve into YouTube's search bar, and this is the first video that comes up with 1.6 million views, and he links directly to Century of Enslavement. Thank you for doing that, Chris, because if you go through and look at some of these replies, <laughs> uh, they're, they're not on Chris's side. Uh, this video has done more for humanity than you ever will. This is a great video. Thanks for the link. What's inaccurate about that video? This is actually a great video. Thanks for sharing. I mean, over and over, there's quite a, quite a few responses in here that are quite complimentary. But the point, of course, of Chris's tweet is to go, look, if you go search for Federal Reserve on YouTube, people are going to find information that we don't approve of. Oh, no. Um, well, guess what, Chris? Not anymore, right? So let's just do this live right here. Federal Reserve. Oh, no, you get the Federal Reserve itself. You get how the Federal Reserve works from CNN money. So there you go. You know that's going to be... Uh, accurate. And you got Fox News, you got Fox Business, Federal Reserve, a lot of Federal Reserve uh, videos here. Huh, anything, anything resembling Century of Enslavement? Let's, let's just check. Century 
Oh, you get Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City, a century of confidence from the Kansas City Fed, but no, no century of enslavement at all. Yes, YouTube has scrubbed it from the Federal Reserve search results for some reason or other. Isn't that interesting? Or at least my search results, and hopefully different people have different results, and some people get it by typing Federal Reserve into the YouTube search engine specifically, but... I'm not holding my breath for that. I think the algorithm has been changed after Chris Hayes shamed GooTube into it, and it's very unlikely that you're going to randomly encounter that documentary or probably much of the rest of my work if you're just randomly wandering around YouTube. Now, if you have a search history that shows that you like this conspiracy information, maybe you'll still get recommended my videos, but chances are if you're logged out or if you're at your friend's house or whatever and you go searching, you're not going to find my stuff. Average people are not going to stumble across sites like the Corbett Report in the future as they start to implement something that, as I have said in my recent appearance on uh, Financial Survival that I posted last week, go check it out if you haven't uh, heard it yet, but as I said there, in a way, this is more insidious than the outright banning from the platforms that happens, because when they do that and this drastic move and take someone completely off the platform, that creates attention, that, that gets attention. But when they start soft censoring, and they start making it so you can't search for the video, or they age restrict the video, which interestingly happened uh, not last week, maybe the week before that, to uh, the New World Next Week, where we were talking about Syria and chemical weapons attacks. Two guys sitting, talking to their webcams about chemical weapons attacks. Instantly, upon pushing the publication button, it was age restricted. I got an email instantly saying, this video has been age-restricted. Now, interestingly, that age restriction seems to have been lifted, and it seems that that video is now in the clear, but for some window of time, it was an age-restricted video. You had to be 18 years old and signed into YouTube to see it, i.e. more than half of the audience wouldn't go through that rigmarole, and suddenly it's there. It's not censored, guys. We're not censoring you. It's just... Ooh, you have to jump through 18 hurdles to actually see any of this work. And that's the way this censorship agenda is going to roll out. Um, but on the issue of the censorship agenda, I think the best response to Chris Hayes' tweet came from Richard Grove of TragedyandHope.com, where he said, Tell you what, why don't you make an educational video about the Federal Reserve and inform us as to your insights on its historical evolution? Then we'll all compare the stories and think for ourselves. Calling it conspiracy isn't an argument. It's a shortcut to thinking. And uh, Richard, thank you very much for that tweet, Richard. 100% spot on. And he tops it with this perfect illustration. The television, you know, threatening the viewer, don't think. Just consume our information, if you can even call it that. Information is when it, you know, they'll link you to the actual source documents so you can go read them for yourself, and they tell you, do not trust me, go actually read what these people were saying. But Chris Hayes is saying, don't trust what these people are showing you about what's been said in the past, just listen to us that this is nonsense and quackery. So Richard Grove 100% hits the nail on the head. I'm not calling for anyone to be banned, even MSNBC or any of those other toxic platforms spreading their toxic ideas, uh, funded, well-funded by the uh, corporations that, uh, that are in bed with the banksters that control the government. That, <laughs> again, 100%, they are informationally toxic and they are extremely well-funded. They, they make sure to monetize everything they do, don't they? Uh, but I'm not calling for them to be censored. I'm not saying black the, out their channels and make sure no one ever sees them. I'm saying, well, why don't we have a fair playing field where silly conspiracy quacks like myself sitting in their living room in Japan can create documentaries and put them out there and have the source documents and say, hey guys, look at this, look at this, look at this information, go verify it for yourself. And you can do the same and you can create a debunking of Century of Enslavement and put up your own theory of the Federal Reserve and why it's better than unicorn and rainbows and puppies and sunshine. And people will be able to compare. I mean, that's what this is about, right? You trust that the viewers, the mindless viewers who just sit there and consume what you put out there, you trust that they're independent, free-thinking human beings with minds of their own capable of reasoning and logic and looking at two competing arguments and deciding for themselves which one is more persuasive, right, Chris? That's what this is about. Not about banning voices or saying people shouldn't find this when they're searching for it or we have to do all this soft censorship. No, it's about competing 
information and ideologies and trusting that people have the mental capabilities of sorting through this for themselves. I trust that the audience has that capability and that's why I put all of my source documents and I tell them, don't listen to me, go look at the sources. But you don't do that, do you, Chris? Or Mother Jones or any of these other corporate establishment lapdog media outlets. I wonder why. So, if you go back to the Mother Jones article, this is all stemming from something released by something called the Data and Society. Uh, and this is a report that they recently released by researcher Becca Lewis called Alternative Influence, Broadcasting the Reactionary Right on YouTube. And, uh, of course, unlike Mother Jones and Chris Hayes and their ilk, I will link to this in the show notes for this video, so you can go directly to datasociety.net if you so desire, and you can download the report for yourself, again, by uh, Rebecca Lewis. And if you do, you will find this report, and it's a 61-page PDF document, which purports to describe something that Becca Lewis, the author of this, has decided to call the Alternative Influence Network, AIN, an assortment of scholars, media pundits, and internet celebrities who use YouTube to promote a range of political positions, from mainstream versions of libertarianism and conservatism, all the way to overt white nationalism. <laughs> and they're all the same, right? And they're all in this thing called the Alternative Influence Network. Content creators in the AIN claim to provide an alternative media source for news and political commentary. They function as political influencers who adopt the techniques of brand influencers to build audiences and sell them on far-right ideology. And... I'll let you read the report for yourself, but one thing that's important to note here is the Alternative Influence Network is not a thing. That is not a real thing. That is not an organization. Although Becca Lewis provides this acronym AIN and refers to it as the AIN over and over and over in the report, well, actually, it's not a thing. It's not real. She just created this term to describe this wide range, as she says, this wide range of people spouting political viewpoints, all the way from sort of over here in the center right to the more fringy right to the extreme right. Everything here is all the same, <laughs> which is, again, stupid. But hey, look, they've got this extremely well thought out and elaborate chart that is, it brings perfect clarity to the matter. I mean, look at this. Clearly, they're in a network, right? Because look at all these lines. <laughs> look at all the lines everywhere. <laughs> You'll notice this is a recurring theme in Propaganda Watch, these line graphs that don't actually show anything of significance. But my God, do they look impressive when you put lines between things like this. This is funny because this is the conspiracy, the crazy conspiracy theorist trope, right? You put all these pictures of people up on the wall and you connect them with bits of string, right? That's, that's the crazy conspiracy theorist trope. Here it is! They do this all the time. And I was watching one of the responses to this video uh, by Computing Forever, I believe, who made a great point about this and, and showing how stupid this is and how they're connecting Dave Rubin to someone over here because the, he talked to someone who once had a program that was co-hosted by someone who once talked to someone who w was in an interview with someone else who talked to that person. And now Dave Rubin is directly linked to that person. Again, this is stupidity itself. And it is the very definition. This is, this is the textbook example of that stupid conspiracy theorist crazy quackery meme that they like to show of the crazy guy with the tinfoil hat with the string all over connecting things that don't, that aren't connected. But here it is, and they want you to take theirs seriously. Now, anyway, when you go and read through this report, uh, you'll note that I'm not in this report at all. Uh, not by name, not by association, not by anything. So I, I have nothing to do with this report. Uh, it's just Mother Jones, I guess, decided to throw me in and let me in again with all of this other stuff because of the Chris Hayes tweet. It seemed apropos, I guess. So, yeah, thanks, Becca Lewis. And, and no, not Becca Lewis. Uh, Tanya Riley. Thank you, Tanya Riley, for including me in your report for no reason whatsoever. But anyway, so this report goes on. Um, but I believe it was Computing Forever, or was it Sargon of Akkad? I'll throw the links into both of those reaction videos. I thought they, they did a good job of going through this. But points out that um, there are some really bizarre things that are going on in this report, including talking about the, the problem of the authenticity of these YouTube celebrities that are monetizing their toxic ideas in the 
A-I-N. So again, influencers in the A-I-N instead adopt the strategies of micro-celebrities, particularly the cultivation of authenticity through transparency and responsiveness. For example, micro-celebrities commonly use the intimate genre of vlogging, emerging from webcam culture and personal blogging. Vlogs adhere to very different tro tropes than those of traditional news outlets. They're often highly personal, told through subjective storytelling and effective clues, cues, and take place over long periods of time. The very setting of vlogging, traditionally filmed in bedrooms, at kitchen tables, or in living rooms, makes the videos highly personal. So, here's the mind-boggling, <laughs> like, never-ending tale of snake eating its own tail part of this report, where they're criticizing these people who are vlogging from their living room for vlogging from their living room as a way of, as a strategy to get people to believe that they're real, authentic human beings that actually believe this stuff, or whatever it is. In, but I guess the implication is they secretly have million dollar studios somewhere that they could be going to film this from, but they choose to do it from their living room because they want to manipulate your mind into thinking they're real human beings with a real life, right? Like, yeah, like, literally, right now, I'm sitting here in my, in my little office here in my home in Japan, literally with my child's bibs lying all around on the floor, because I want you to think I'm a, I'm a real human being. It's not because I am a real human being who actually lives in this space. <laughs> I mean... Oh, it's so it's so funny because there's no there's no point here. What is the what is the point they're trying to get at? That I somehow sh what should I be doing? I should be broadcasting from some studio I don't have? No, this is my home. This is where I live. This is this is what I have. Where else am I going to do it from? But of course, the point isn't to make an actual logical point here. It's all this insinuation and oh, we'll let we'll we'll kind of point people in a direction that seems vague and sketchy just to make them think, imagine the rest of the the, the argument. But there is no other argument. It's it reminds me of <laughs> the Plinkett Star Wars reviews if you've seen them, where where he does that thing where there's he's trying to figure out some part of the plot that makes absolutely no sense, and he's got like three or four different voices going at the same time trying to figure out this and that. Someone should someone should really break this down using a Plinkett review kind of thing theme. <laughs> oh, that would be hilarious. Actually, I think there are many different ways that. All of us, anyone who's involved in this in what, whatever form, even as someone, even if you don't have a vlog or have a website or do a do blogging or anything, you, obviously, if you're tuned into the corporate report, this does affect you. This affects you when they start talking about taking people off of platforms because, oh my God, political wrong think. Of course, this affects everyone, and this the question really is how how to properly. Uh, address and respond to this. And recently on the Corbett Report, there were some interesting ideas about ways that people can repackage this information to feed directly into all of the all of the political correctness buzzwords and terms that will make sure that they sail right through any algorithms or any bots or any people that are looking to flag things. So taking whatever it is Century of Enslavement or anything else and reposting it under a different title about, you know, racist bankers and their monetary hate crimes uh, was one of the suggestions in the comment section. I'll link you to that because I think it was a great idea that someone should be doing. And that's why I always encourage people, yes, repost, republish my stuff, put it out there. And yeah, change the titles and make it whatever so that people will find it in other ways because... I'm telling you, it's happening. The soft censorship is already happening, and it will turn into hard censorship. It already is for some people, as we all know, that some people are being deplatformed already, and that, of course, is just the thin edge of the wedge to justify the large crackdowns when they come. And on that note, I just want to point out one more thing about this Mother Jones article, something I found particularly chilling and right in your face. Uh, Mother Jones asks the question to Becca Lewis, who wrote this report, one way these posters define themselves is by saying they are underdogs who are being attacked by mainstream society. Do you have any thoughts on how to de-platform or demonetize these creators if they turn just turn around and point to those efforts as examples of the very def discrimination they can use to bolster their claims? So, 
The question essentially is, these crackpot conspiracy wackos think that we're trying to censor them. How can we censor them without giving them the ammo to, to say they're being censored? That is the real question, and the answer, that's a fundamental question that's been plaguing academics and tech firms alike. My interpretation is that the framing of social underdog paranoia thrives when content moderation and platforming happens inconsistently and without a clear explanation. And the fact that is that if, then the fact is that if extremists, <laughs> in square brackets, were being consistently deplatformed, they wouldn't be able to make content about it. Think about that. Think about what they're saying. If we chop off enough heads all at the same time, just chop them off, silence all those voices, then there won't be any voices left to complain about it, right? Yay! We've achieved our information utopia on YouTube by getting rid of everyone that we disagree with all in one blow. That is what they are now openly advocating. How can we censor them without looking like we're trying to censor them? Well, why don't you just kill them all at once and then there's no one left to complain? There are no words for how chilling, how horrible these ideas are. And they are not coming from the conspiracy quackos who go and actually research and show you independent documents. They're coming from the people who want to silence people who are doing exactly that. And oh, just on some note, who is this data and society? Datasociety.net. Who, who are they? Where, do they? where do they get their funding? Oh, oh, that's right. Yeah, of course. I mean, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation or... Uh, oh, you know, John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. They, they funded Sesame Street or Mr. Rogers or something, right? They must be all good. Oh, the National Science Foundation. Well, uh, there you go. Microsoft, you know, Bill Gates' old uh, stomping grounds. They, they must be in it for good. Oh, the New York Times. Of course the New York Times uh, is funding this website that is promoting ideas about how to censor their competition online. Of course they are. But of course it gets even better. Oh, the Omidyar Network. Do you not know the Omidyar Network? Type in Omidyar into my search bar and you will be enlightened about some of the issues surrounding Omidyar Network. Or, oh, of course, Open Society Foundation. There it is. Boom. Hi, George. How you doing? So um, anyway, you can go and look through all the different sponsors. But there you go. It's a 501c3 research institute. So it's it's all above board. It's all cool, guys. Just listen to what they say. And when they come to say these these channels should be taken off and banned, just do it, right? Just do it. Hey, it's like Nike. Maybe Nike could run us as a sponsorship campaign for this. Just do it, guys. Anyway, there you go. This is it in a nutshell. Is it not? This is where we are going. And as I say, the hard censorship is there on the table and they're openly talking about how to do it best. Well, you got to get everyone at the same time. But even barring that, the soft censorship is starting and we all see it happening and you can go see it now. Look at the Federal Reserve on YouTube. Century of Enslavement, nowhere in sight for some reason or other. So yeah, it's already starting and it just takes, of course, some faux... Oh my god, look at this horrible documentary from some MSM talking head, and uh, that's all it takes. And suddenly Century of Enslavement is gone from search results, and you're not likely to find it uh, unless you already know about it. And that's the way things roll. Um, documentaries by a guy made literally sitting in his room in Japan, because that's... This is the only room I have. I don't have some studio that I could go and go to if I wanted to. This is where I make my stuff, and I've made documentaries that have been seen millions of times, but probably not anymore. Uh, it's difficult to get that kind of traction anymore because they are doing the soft censorship that's going to turn into the hard censorship. As I say, if you are watching this report, it affects you, and it affects everyone in society more broadly, as you know, because... I started off not knowing about or not believing all this conspiracy information stuff until I started looking stuff up for myself online. Well, when we come to the age where you can't do that, or at least can't do that without going through 18,000 hurdles, then we're living in an age of thought control so complete that we won't even know our thoughts are being controlled. I've talked about this concept before, the Library of Babel and all of that. Go look it up. I'll put the, put, put the links to all of this in my show notes, as always, so that you can go look it up for yourself. Um, but that's it, and that's the state of things. So this, uh, this is a web of propaganda that is becoming quite scary for what it portends, which is not just propaganda that they're trying to feed you, 
but they are trying to prohibit you from seeing anything other than their propaganda. And that's how things are going to con start, uh, continue to roll as we move through this age of sweat censorship that is coming. I've said it before, I've said it a million times before, I'll say it a million times until I get my head chopped off in the great YouTube purge of 2019 or whatever is coming, but I will continue to say it. If you are only watching me on YouTube, you will lose my voice at some point. You will lose touch with me. Go to CorbettReport.com, bookmark that for your future reference. Go to BitChute and DTube and Steemit and all the other platforms I'm on, and I'll throw links into that as well. But most importantly, CorbettReport.com is where you're going to find me uh, for the time being. And I'll keep doing this work, and if you guys keep supporting me, I'll keep doing it. So let's move on together through the propaganda and uh, all the rest, and I'll be here cutting through it as usual. James Corbett, CorbettReport.com So it dawned on me at the end of last year that I'd never used the Twitter poll function. And I thought to myself, what better way to use the poll function than to engage in that holy sacrament of the statist religion, selection. I mean, election. Yes, have a vote. Everyone likes voting. It gives them the illusion of control, right? So, the Corbett Report held a Twitter vote. Now, the three choices that I offered people are the three choices that you get in most elections in most polities around the world, i.e. choice, basically the same choice, and a hipsterish alternative. And we were away to the races. And the early results showed choice, basically the same choice, were up there with hipsterish alternative, but before too long, as you might have expected from my audience, the hipsterish alternative started to take the lead. And boy, did that work well. Uh, uh, well, welcome to every vote that's ever taken place in history, to one form or another, to one extent or another. Uh, it's always the same, isn't it? And uh, I'm glad that a lot of people got it, got the humor, joked along. A lot of people understood exactly what was happening and why it was happening, but some people <laughs> didn't. <laughs> some people complained as if this was some sort of real election. Well, why, you know, there's never a choice for, for none of the above, or, uh, or uh, what's going on? Why would, why, uh, Henry Kissinger isn't hipsterish alternative. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you get it? Don't you understand? That is the entire point. That is exactly what every election is like. Selection. They cloak themselves in whatever cloak looks good to the public, and then they uncloak themselves after they get into power. It happens again and again and again and again and again. From Syriza in Greece to everyone else, they all betray whoever voted them into power for whatever transitory reasons. That was the point. And so, I'm glad that this uh, selection became a dumpster fire of sorts, because that's exactly what it was intended to do. That's what all selections are intended to do. Remember, the real power is not in voting harder. The real power is in taking matters into your own hand, deciding what you will do each and every day. You vote every single day with how you choose to spend your time, what you spend your money on, who you spend, uh, who you befriend and who you shun. All of that is your vote that you make every day. And those are the votes that matter, not casting ballots for a politician. Anyway, I'll leave the link in the show notes so you can explore that little Twitter poll. Thought it was a funny little experiment that I wanted to share with all of you. That's going to do it for today from the sunny climes of Western Japan. James Corbett, CorbettReport.com.